Welcome to the FXB Center. My name is Jacqueline Barber and I'm the Director of Research at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at um, Harvard University. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our fourth webinar on the topic of health and human rights um, in Palestine and the occupied territories. Today, our title is From Resilience to Resistance, the state of children's health in the occupied Palestinian territories. So welcome again. And um, I just wanted to make a couple of very brief introductory comments before I introduce our um, three panelists. So um, I think all of us are aware of how Palestine and Israel enter into mainstream um, news reporting uh, when there are large scale attacks, large, large scale issues of violence and, um, and, and um, consequences for, for local populations. But um, there is not much ongoing attention drawn to the daily, the quotidian impact of human rights violations on, um, on health and on well being the way in which um, living under occupation, being exposed to regular checkpoints, to material scarcity, to service failures, how that really um, conditions the quality of, of life for people. Um, and nevertheless, of course, it's the case that violence continues um, between these dramatic flare-ups on a daily basis. And of course, children and young people um, are in a way particularly affected because um, the whole world is caught up in um, the circumstances that, that, that drive this, this, this situation. So whether it's daily skirmishes, whether it's the sleep, uh, disturbed sleep patterns, whether it's um, lack of mobility, lack of access to justice, to education, there's so many impacts that um, really we need to consider. But today, as I said, we are going to be focused on health, not just health as not being sick, but health in the way that we understand it in the public health world as a much broader sense of well-being and thriving. Um, and so uh, I'm delighted to um, introduce our panelists and I will introduce them uh, in the order in which they'll speak um, one at a time. So our first speaker is going to be, uh, is Professor Nadira, Shaloub Kevokian, who is the Lawrence Beale Chair, who has the Lawrence Beale Chair in Law at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, but she is also the Chair in Global Law at Queen Mary University in London. So, uh, Professor Shaloub Kevokian, many, many thanks to you for joining us. And I wonder if you could start off by just framing this complicated context for us, the situation um, in the, the territories and the way in which as you see it, the overall context impacts um, the health and well-being or lack thereof of children and young people. So over to you, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for the introduction. And thank you for thinking about the Palestinian children. And let me really start by staging my analysis on childhood in the context of settler colonialism. And to me, when we're looking at childhood in the settler colonial context, we really need to remember, number one, that it's a structure and we need to look at the structure and it's not an event of attacking a child and therefore there is a problem, but rather a structure that is operating there. And number two, it's about the eviction of the native and the native child and the indigenization of the settler. And therefore the settler is constantly indigenizing uh, themselves and, and um, evicting. And it's embedded in the logic of elimination. So number one, we need to understand Palestinian childhood in this context, in the settler colonial context. Number two, I want us really to remember at state criminality, because what we see against children is state criminality. And I'll explain it by my way. I'll, I'll, I'll choose the voice of Lema. And Lema is a Palestinian child from uh, occupied Jerusalem who spoke to me while pointing at the military checkpoint uh, erected in the communal space of Babel Amud, the Damascus Gate, and saying, and I'm quoting here, every morning on my way to school, I see those new checkpoints. I call them, my classmates call them this way too, the killing boxes. 
and ask myself, who else do they want to kill today? My childhood is loaded with their killing boxes because they do not consider us as children at all. So Lemma's analysis of the mundane, the multiple state technologies around her space, her walk to school, against her land, her community, as well as her childhood, reveals an uncounted necropolitical workings of the power in the settler colony. So those killing boxes, as Lemma defined them, uh, uh, suggest that state judicial order constructed as watchtowers, because this is what Israel calls them, watchtowers, in Lema's land, in Lema's space, used her childhood years, including her morning walk to school between 7.30 and 8, as a site of violent militaristic penetration. So the space of her walk to school is turned into a zone of violence, where the state of exception is deemed to operate in the service of the Zionist settler colonial regime. So walking with Lemma, hearing her explanation about historical atrocities against her loved one, watching her pointing her finger at the killing boxes, really uncovered not only the state's technology of brutal expulsion, but also how violence marks children's bodies and life as disposable or as what I call unchilded others. So number one, let us keep this in mind, her voice, children's voices. Number two, I want to insist on the importance of grounding our analysis in the historical, because the history is part of the reading of the context, politics, psychosocial, and legal context. Now, the racialized settler colonial context discussed when considering childhood in Palestine maintains that land, is life and children are society's future. Stripping children of their rights, life and land, using them as political capital to maintain the settler state sovereignty and unchilding them in the name of the Zionist imagined exclusivity as members of the chosen people owned of God's promised land, incarcerated childhood in an unfutured death zone. If we read children as political capital and take seriously their critiques and observations of the colonial power, we can also see how Palestinian children are constantly pushing back against this logic of elimination and the ideology and structure of their suffering. So they are constantly resisting, refusing, yeah? So children's responses to militaristic settler colonialism goes really beyond the fact that they are the future. Children like Lemma respond to injustice and to state violence viscerally because it hurts here, yeah? And effectively and directly, and their reactions are less affected by the normalizing penalties of the state. Therefore, you know, my work really, I argue that children are political capital in the hands of the state. And we can see this in other places in settler colonial context. You know, we've seen it in Australia with the stolen generation. We have seen it in Canada. We've seen it in Australia where, you know, children are so-called dying from improvement, from saving, from, and so on. But there, the story was, it was about killing the Indian and saving the child. And what I'm claiming in the Palestinian context, that is not the story. So I come with a proposition of a concept of unchilding mm -hmm. to understand childhood under the Israeli settler colonial context in which the bodies of children become contested politicized objects and children are transformed into legalized instruments that can be used to enact state violence against them, against their families and communities. So unchilding exposes the racialized political work of violence designated to create, direct, govern, transform, and construct colonized children as dangerous racialized others, enabling their eviction from the realm of childhood itself. Unchilding, as, as I put it, is aligned with and operates along the twisted logic of necropolitics, yeah, whereby the present and the historical realities of who has died in the past, who gets to be born, 
live and who is left to die now, whether actually or, or symbolically, violates the purity of historical uh, context across time and spaces and becomes inscribed instead on children's living, maimed and dead body, on children who are always already illegitimate non-subjects if I use uh, Jaspier Poir. So the use and the, the, the proposition of the concept of unchilding is there to shed the light on the effect of racial violence and colonialism on really the intimate life of children, yeah? So unchilding to me moves between various contexts. So it's the local context, but it's also the global context because global silent and inaction is also unchilding our kids, yeah? It, 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 it moves between spaces. So it's between the space of Lama on her way to school in the morning, the economic space, and her bodily space, it invades womb, it invades family, it invades friendship, home, schools, hospital. And childing is flexible, as I see it, adaptable and unpredictable. And it works to enable the complex machinery of violence against children, causing really psychic wounding with the accumulative trauma. And unchilding allows us to, to, to understand how they imprison, injure, uh, traumatize, and how the political occupation uh, looks at children's resistance to and their power to what I say, not only to the power of the colonizer to unchild, but the power of the child to interrupt this unchilding. So the mere walk to school to me is an interruption of the state's unchilding. And here Lemma have explained, she said another thing and let me quote her. She said, whenever you go in our homeland, you are faced with killing boxes. You think those checkpoints and airplanes that are killing children in the march of return in Gaza are not killing boxes, they are flying killing boxes. They operate them with remote controls. And we live between those boxes and children are wounded and killed by the shooters. And sometimes you die without dying. And sometimes you resist while dying. So listen, you know, when you listen carefully to a child like Lemma, like it opens up our eyes and Lemma in her own words shared the wider logics of Israel settler colonial necropolitics. It is in the voices and witnessing like Lemma that I really ground my analysis pointing to children's social suffering or what Rita Jackman brilliantly defined as the ones inside, yeah? So children voices that pointed to the ones inside led me to the concept of unchilding because it really allowed me to reveal the multiple layers of state violence of its work as a settler colony, inclu including its founding violence because they kept on talking about the history. My grandmother used to carry the key. My grandmother is like, you hear history, politics, analysis. You hear the unpacking of the structure of oppression. You hear children talking about ongoing disciplinary power of the state, the biopolitics of the state in Jerusalem, for example, in the issue of the IDs, the residents, and, the, uh, and the, the ability to revoke residency. So analyzing children's lives and ordeals incarcerated within the violent colonial frames. Unchilding invites us really to examine the political and ethical children a question of children that count and search for the unending mundane moments of dispossession, yeah? Such as seven in the morning when Lemma and her classmates face the violence of the killing boxes while on their way to school, which really creates the political work and the governance of life and of the future against our children. So living as a child between the terror of the settler state, its technologies of violence and its killing boxes and the counted and uncounted violences of unchilding is hoped to expose the implication of the structural, institutional and everyday violence of the state. Uh, Professor Shalub Kivokan, thank you for that really magnificently rich and stimulating um, 
introduction. There's so much uh, you've given us to, to think about, and I'm sure we will come back to some of your points. Um, but thank you. That was really a very powerful um, conceptual framing of the situation with many concepts that you, you've introduced for us to, to use, I think, going forward. Um, may I now please introduce our second speaker? Uh, we're going to go from sort of a large scale conceptual framing to, in a way, the front line of advocacy, which is in what we always do at the FXB Center. We try to combine scholarship, research, um, theoretical constructions with the day-to-day -day business of actually fighting for social justice. And so we're going to do that on this panel too. And so our second speaker is Shaina Lowe, who's the advocacy officer for De Defense for Children International Palestine, a very highly respected, wonderful organization with an amazing track record of, of human rights work in the region. So um, Shaina, thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we've just heard uh, from Nadira, uh, uh, um, I think a really powerful framing of unchilding and its many um, consequences and this concept also of necropolitics, which I think is a, also a very, very suggestive one. Um, but you work on the front line kind of with um, human rights abuses daily suffered by Palestinians, including by, by children. So can you tell us, a little bit about um, what your organization does and then also tell us a bit please about the kind of main um, abuses that you see and maybe something about how those abuses also relate to to this concept of resistance that we are exploring so over to you thank you thank you very much jackie and and thanks to the folks at the fxb center for hosting this uh panel i'm really thrilled to be here uh as jackie alluded to uh, Defense for Children International Palestine is on the front lines documenting human rights abuses in the occupied Palestinian territory. We're the only uh, Palestinian human rights group devoted exclusively to protecting and promoting and, uh, the rights of, of Palestinian children in the OPT. Um, so I, I uh, Professor Shalhoub Kevorkian uh, gave a lot of for us to chew on but I wanna talk a bit about some of the abuses that we document, the human rights violations that we document, both thinking in terms of kind of the flashy things that, that we see on the front page of the New York Times when there's a flare up, but also looking a bit more at, at some of the, the things that we don't see in the headlines and addressing those. Um, so first of all, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this year, we've documented the most children killed in the occupied Palestinian territory since 2014 um, and Israel's military assault on Gaza that year. So we've documented 83 Palestinian children who've been killed, 75 of whom we've confirmed um, were at the hands of Israeli forces. Um, obviously, these children's deaths um, it impact not only their families, but entire communities, um, their, the children's friends and, and classmates, um, teammates. And, and so it's important to think that these aren't just individual lives that are, that are being lost, but, but losses for entire communities. I'm gonna share my screen to give just some illustrations of some of the, the work that we're doing. So Defense for Children, International Palestine actually got its start as a legal defense organization defending Palestinian children who are arrested and detained in, in Israel's military detention system. And so each year about 500 to 700 Palestinian children are detained and prosecuted in Israeli military courts that lack fundamental fair trial rights. Um, we document due process violations, systematic ill treatment, um, and about 60% of the children who we document going through this process are arrested in night arrest, like the one you see depicted in this illustration from their homes in the middle of the night. And these arrests obviously aren't just traumatic for the children themselves um, as they're experiencing it, but this is a, a trauma that's inflicted upon entire families. Um, siblings witness the arrest and detention, communities witness the, the detention of, of 
of neighbors and and it's meant as a means of of controlling entire communities it only takes about 500 to 700 each year to be able to to really control and 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 uh prevent resist resistance from communities this is kind of the sweet spot um and and that fear that there's a fear that really pervades Palestinian communities wondering which child will be next um, and and wondering um, as each child goes to bed at night if if they're going to be the one that's taken. It also can feed um, what we've seen is like distrust between Palestinians in communities because children are often coerced into um, giving in intelligence information or making confessions true or, or false against neighbors. So it's also a means of disrupting the, the fabric of Palestinian communal life. Um, and, and we see that the impact of detention isn't just while the child is being detained, but can have a, an impact far beyond that. So um, just to give an example, these are screenshots, oops, screenshots uh, from a short documentary, I'll drop the link in the in the chat when I'm when I'm finished. That we made about a, a child, Obaida Jawabra, whose um, picture is on the right hand side of the screen. Um, unfortunately, Obaida um, was killed earlier this year, just three weeks shy of his 18th birthday. But the reason that we made this documentary about him was that Obaida had been detained and and prosecuted in Israeli military courts twice. But at the beginning of the film, you know, his friend is asking him, are you scared that you're going to go back to prison? And he says, the problem is Route 60 and how to cross it to go to school. So Obaida lives in a, lived in a, in Arub refugee camp, um, which is an area um, surrounded by Israeli settlements right in the heart of the Gush Etzion, um region. Uh, settlement region, and in order for him to to get to school each day, he had to pass by um, Israeli occupation infrastructure, and those are often the friction points where we see that ch that children's rights are being violated the most. Whether it's it's um, in in their own communities, like like Obaida, who was detained from Aru refugee camp, or when they're trying to get to school, where they might be encountering settlers um, and soldiers. Uh, in terms of, and, and, and I, I just want to flag that this year we've documented really an unprecedented rise in, in um, settler attacks against Palestinian children, um, including some extremely brutal attacks, children who have been shot by Israeli settlers under the protection of Israeli forces, um, children who have been kidnapped by Israeli settlers and, and tortured and brutally beaten. Um, and so these are the types of experiences that that Palestinian children are experiencing on a day to day basis. I want to just flag one community that we documented um, and, and wrote a feature on um, last year, which is located in the northern part of the West Bank. As I mentioned, we often document violations um, that are close to occupation infrastructure. So in this case, this community, Dahar al-Malah, is located inside of the, the what's known as the Barta enclave. So basically, it's a community um, that has been effectively annexed by the Israeli separation wall. The community is based on the um, western side of the wall. Um, and, and the rest of the West Bank is on the eastern side of the wall, making it um, a daily challenge for these children to even get to school. In order for these kids to get to school, they have to cross through a, a, what, what's described as a military gate, but you can see in the photos is really a, a, a checkpoint um, for Palestinian children. These kids have to show their birth certificates um, and permits in order to access their schools daily, facing humiliation, being forced at gunpoint, these have impacts on the kids beyond beyond just the the few minutes of inconvenience that the children experience when trying to get to and from school, but obviously impact the their ability to focus, their ability to feel safe in school. Um, and they talk about in in our interviews with them 
just the, the daily challenges, whether it's getting muddy on the way to school or whether it's having the checkpoint be closed and unable to make their their exams. The, there, there is a school located, a, a middle school and high school located inside of the enclave that the children could go to, but it's um, two miles walk. And in order for the children to get there, they would have to pass Israeli settlements and, and, uh, and an Israeli military base. So putting themselves at, they're basically put at risk if they were to take that option as well. The up until uh, last year or two years ago, rather, um, children as young as first grade had to cross through this checkpoint in order to get to school every day. And so the community built an elementary school inside of um, inside of inside of Dahar al Malah um, in order for the kids to not have to undergo that experience every day. Now it's children under the age of twelve can can remain um, in school at home. Um, however, um, this school that was constructed is one of fifty three schools that are current currently pending demolition orders. And so even, even though they've built this school in their community in order to prevent the children from undergoing trauma of, of needing to pass through soldiers, needing to present permits in order to attend school, um, they, they, um, they still are, are, have the uncertainty that their school might not exist tomorrow, that, that that the demolition order could be executed. And there are 53 schools in the West Bank right now that have these pending demolition orders um, and they're attended by uh, over 5,000 students. That's according to um, the UN Office uh, for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance. Um, I just wanna mention before I, before I close out um, a couple of the ways that that we're working to address some of these issues, both externally in terms of our advocacy work, and then also internally working to empower Palestinian children. So first of all, we have an accountability program that conducts international advocacy. So we run a campaign here in the United States and in other countries abroad, working to raise attention and awareness um, and put an end to, to the violations against children, most notably, um, the impact of, of uh, child detention in the Israeli military detention system. But we also engage with, with more um, typical uh, international bodies. So um, UN bodies and, and of course the International Criminal Court. Um, we also work in, in inside of the West Bank to empower Palestinian children to, to and educate them about what their rights are and train them to be able to document rights violations inside of their own communities to give them that sense of taking ownership um, over their, over their um, futures. Most of the work that they're doing is based on internal violations related to, to Palestinian authority um, violations, but it's working to make sure that children know what what they're entitled to and, and have a voice to advocate for that. So in addition to training these kids to go and document um, rights abuses, we have a, a children's council with representatives from each of the different regions that we work in um, who work to, to basically give a voice to, to their peers and, and advocate at the national level for, for what they feel is, is necessary. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now, um, but thank you very much. Thank you, Shana. That was just a, uh, an amazing, um, terrifying actually, very moving uh, chronicle of, I think it's what uh, Nera called the unending mundane moments of, of dispossession and violence, unending. I mean, this, this idea of the killing box, how, how you experience it and how you feel it every day and the, the kind of grotesque idea that constructing a school which children can access safely should be listed for demolition it, it's it's grotesque is i think the only word that comes to mind so thank you thank you for for sharing this what an incredible job your your organization uh, does and and i also really think the point you made finally about actually getting children to be 
you know, to document um, and to be spokespersons for their own um, situation and to be agents um, is wonderful because, of course, this is how you're building, you know, or they are building their future kind of as leaders and, and, and advocates. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so, and we will come back to a discussion, um, but let me uh, introduce our, our, our third speaker, Dr. Jumana Ude, who is um, actually a, a very close friend. She is, um, has been associated with our center now for many years and directs our disability rights program. Um, but more importantly, I suppose she is um, a pediatrician who founded the Palestinian Happy Child Center, which is an extraordinary um, institution in Ramallah. Um, and her role in not only in Palestine, but in the Middle East as, as a whole, and actually beyond as a, an expert on an advocate for the rights of children with intellectual dis disabilities is really hard to, to overstate. Um, um, Dr. Ode has, has worked with, particularly with children uh, who suffer from or who are, have conditions of, of autism and of, um, of, of Down syndrome, but she has much more broadly um, discussed how, how the context of living in this tinderbox, um, this unlivable pl place um, impacts children who of course are particularly vulnerable. So um, Dr. Ode, thank you so much for, for joining us and welcome to our panel. So um, you are, we, we, we've heard from a, a scholar and an intellectual, we've heard from a, a, a human rights lawyer, and now you are a doctor. So um, how do these um, experiences of mundane cruelty and violence um, manifest in the clinical setting that you see? And how do you um, experience the, the daily um, lives of the children who you're trying to, and you are uh, making enormous efforts to, to give a happy childhood? Please, please tell us a little bit about, about your experience. Thank you, Jackie. And uh, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. And I'm happy to be part of this. And thank you for the organizers because it's very important to highlight the life of the day life of ch Palestinian children. Uh, so I will share my screen uh, with uh, some slides. Channels, but I'll share. Yes. Uh, first of all, happy Halloween to all kids of the world who celebrate Halloween. This uh, slide, it's not representing Halloween, unfortunately, but this is a picture of Palestinian kids that we take care of. And it is part of our uh, um, uh, program and uh, intervention program and treatment that we give to the ventilation activities, uh, or uh, we call them recreational activities or happy uh, days or fun days for the children to start to try to normalize what is abnormal. And usually I say, no matter what our kids react to any reaction, the reactions are normal reaction to abnormal situation that they live. So this is, this is what we do in order for our to overcome uh, the this um, this kind of uh, life that they live under continuous war. I'm sure they do. Yes, uh, and I decided today to share with you three, four actually, including one, four anecdotal stories, and uh, including one personal. So I would start with uh, um, with Omar's Omar's story. In uh, at the age of ten, Omar uh, already had six and a half years of intervention at the PHCC at the Happy Child uh, at the Happy Child Center, including two uh, school visits, one home visits monthly, uh, regular discussions and intervention uh, programs, psychosocial, I mean, with the family, with the mother and mother uh, support. So it, uh, uh, all intervention sessions that he got in six and a half year were about 1,650 sessions. Umar comes from a village uh, just 15 kilometers far from Ramallah, about uh, nine miles. And in the six and a half 
years, he has to go and come through checkpoints and uh, which made it, he, he made about 624 hours, uh, 624 trips to the center to get the treatment. And uh, he, he lost or he wasted about 1,870 hours on the checkpoint and on the road while he was coming, as I mentioned, only mi nine miles away from the center. And imagine this uh, checkpoint, uh, the turnstiles, the length of the bar, the international standard is about uh, 120 to 90 centimeters while these turnstiles, the length of the bar is only 70 centimeters, which means for, imagine a, a mother with a disabled child going through more than one set of turnstiles every day or going to school on daily basis. This is what our kids experience while going from one place to another. But the, uh, uh, I mean, now uh, Omar, got 1600 hours of treatment and he lost and wasted 18, 1800 hours on the checkpoints. Still, this was what uh, his uh, family uh, did bravely, uh, believing that they, what they are doing is for the best of the future of their child who was suffering from or continue to, who had uh, autism, autism spectrum disorder. Another story, the second story, and this, uh, I will tell the story of Amal, who had epilepsy and ADSD and, uh, and autism spectrum disorder. Uh, I will quote her words. Doctor, I fell down on the ground. I don't want to fall down again. I don't like it, she told me. Amal's father, in order to explain the urgency, recalled, Doctor, you remember, don't you? that Amal has had no seizures for more than six months. You were so pleased that she was responding to the treatment. But three days ago, we ran out of medicine and she started having bad seizures again and we could do nothing. This conversation took place on a checkpoint, at a checkpoint when I rushed to the checkpoint to give Amal her medication. I'm talking here about the curfews when we used to have, especially in 2000, 2001, 2002. So uh, one uh, outstanding example of the uh, community participation was when during the times of crisis, when uh, the curfews were imposed on uh, Palestinian uh, by the occupied the occupier by the Israeli occupation in all Palestinian villages, camps, cities, and refugee camps. So. Uh, uh, and traveling from one place to another was almost impossible, dangerous, and very difficult. So the main concern was for our staff at the Happy Child, how can we bring medicine? Although we had our, usually I say we have plan A, B, C. We can't see, you're leaving your house to your work or to school to what, or to wherever. You have to have more than one plan because you can leave home and you don't know if you can come back or you come back at all. So uh, one of our concerns was how to bring the medication to the children. So the, uh, we had to cooperate with the community in each area. And sometimes we used to give uh, the, medication, uh, the, medica the medication to a villager or a butcher in the village or a grocer or a relative who lives next to the, or close to the, uh, checkpoint because they used to impose the, the curfew for three days, one one week, two weeks, and they will uh, uh, the curfew will be uh, over only for two hours, three hours, something like that. So we found this was the only way to bring the medication to our kids, especially chronically ill kids or kids who can't live without this medication. They have to continue with their medications. So the community members were part of the system that we uh, put in place in order to face the critical time that we uh, went, uh, went through. A, a third story, and we, we could see the, the community 
supporting each other, being close to each other. My third story is a personal one. When my little daughter, who's now a mother and an engineer, a mother of a daughter, two years old daughter, uh, she was only 12 years old when our house was shelled because we live uh, close or next, uh, uh, opposite to a settlement, uh, Israeli settlement. So our uh, house was shelled from midnight to six o'clock in the morning. And since we are, we live in the, our house was in the main road, we had to run away to our neighbors to hide in their house. So from midnight till six o'clock, uh, we were there then at six o'clock, everything stopped and the kids woke up and they tried to go to school. So I found that my daughter with our other neighbors, they were, to, each of them took a plastic bag and went back outside to collect the uh, bullets, the, I mean, uh, the empty bullets and put them in the plastic bag. Then she took a shower and went to school. So at school, after about a couple of hours, her English teacher called us and he said, uh, today we had a, a, a show and tell at the uh, English lesson and Tala told a very painful story. She showed the bullets to her classmates and she told them that we have to run to our neighbor's house and hide there and sleep there. And it was somehow funny because we, all of us, me, my sister, and the other five kids, of neighbor's kids, we slept all on the kitchen floor. And I hugged my neighbor and my mom kept telling us, don't worry, it will stop. Soon it will stop. Keep going, try to sleep and nothing will happen. You are okay, you are safe. I don't know how come I got this. I was sure, I wasn't sure of course that they are safe, they were not safe, but I had to lie then to overcome it. Anyway, and her, uh, she shared her story with her classmates and her teacher was almost in tears saying that I don't know what to do uh, with those kids after this uh, event. The last story I will include, conclude with, actually uh, these uh, uh, are some recreational activities that we do for chronically ill kids in Augusta Victoria Hospital, children with uh, either renal failure or kidney diseases or uh, uh, mainly leukemia and cancers. As uh, Jackie mentioned also, uh, one of our group that we serve are children with autism. And uh, I will conclude with the last story, which is Ali's story. I wrote uh, 19 years ago, therefore I will read it if you allow. Um, uh, early in two, uh, two, uh, 2020, a staff member answered the door at the PHC, at the Palestine Happy Child Center. And standing there, she saw a young, handsome guy. When she asked him, how can I help you? He answered, I am Ali, don't you remember me? Ali first came to the PHCC when he was six years old. He was suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, after witnessing a shelling of his home by Israeli army, aimed to kill a Palestinian political leader who lived in, in his building. He was suffering from selective mutism, a severe anxiety disorder that causes a, personal, a person to stop speaking for several, for a certain time. He refused to leave home and had terrible nightmares. Ali's parents then heard that the PHCC was offering psychosocial, psychosocial support for children with war trauma and brought him to the center. Ali told everyone what had become of him in the, in the past 19 years. I am 25 years old today, he began his narrative, and will never forget this place. You helped me in 2001, overcome my problem. His clinical file shows that he began to talk again after six months of treatment. He asked to see the room where he met with his therapist then, and told us he remembered how the psychologist gave him a crayon to and let him uh, draw. He then proceeded to tell us that after finishing high school, he decided to become a photographer. 
so that he could document the crimes committed against Palestinians by the Israeli occupation. I want to show the whole world how it is affecting children. Uh, I want to show the I want to show the whole world how proximate and tangible the Israeli military occupation is, and how it is affecting children who, like me, are losing their childhood. Ali needed to visit the PHCC and show his gratitude in order to close this important circle of his life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jumana. Um, that is so moving and it's uh, a wonderfully upbeat um, way to end some searing, searingly painful uh, stories that you've told us, um, which is very much in line with the, um, the kind of framing of our panel altogether. So, so thank you so much. I think, um, you know, our first panelist, um, Nada, talked about the way in which our children are responding viscerally, but are also taking control and are kind of, in a way, countering this kind of necropolitics of violence which they're subjected to and I think uh, Shana you too talked about you know children as agents children as actors in this situation despite this trauma so it's particularly amazing to hear of a child who obviously was so you know deeply impacted that he, he, he didn't even speak for six months to hear him now um, you know able to, to think about the bigger picture and it's a testament really to, to this in incredible work that the center does but also to the to the um, to the power of, of that these children somehow have and presumably absorb from their parents and from their community so we have several uh, really interesting questions and I'm going to really um, read them and, and invite you all to comment but before I do that there's just one question that I would like um, each of you to answer as we I think collectively think you know what are the steps to move forward we all know I think many of us are aware of how how um, the uh, Israeli military has recently labeled six organizations, including yours, Shana, um, as being terrorist organizations. And you may want to say something about that. But, you know, this is kind of a, another just, um, you know, paradoxical distortion of, of, of reality in a way, a kind of double think the, the situation often evokes. But um, um, who are the people who have been, um, who are the professionals, who are the kind of institutions that have been a part of the struggle in a supportive way, who've shown solidarity? Are there particular constituencies or particular um, communities, particular disciplines that you can think of, each of you, who have um, really engaged, uh, particularly with the issues of children and young people in the Palestinian context, with this notion of unchilding, which I think is so, unfamiliar in a way and so powerful. So maybe each of you would just say a few words of who your allies are or who are the people outside your own immediate circle who you've been able to, to, to rely on and who've helped kind of amplify the work that you do. So maybe um, Nadara, you can start and then Shana and then Jumana and then we'll open, I'll, I'll, I'll bring in some of the questions. Just to, to think of what's the broader universe within which the work you do um, sits. Yeah, I, I think let me pick on some of the issues that you were raising and, uh, and remember that part of calling and defining the six organizations, DCI, Al Haq, and you know, Damir, we're talking about organizations that are really very important for us to continue, for collective support, for connectivity, and what, uh, and to call them terrorist organization is exactly attesting to state terror. It's exactly what the settler colonial machinery of oppression that the state of Israel is doing by defining some. So this is part when you were, when you were asking about children, childhood, and then connecting it to banning and to calling such organizations. I will start by saying, let us look at epistemic violence. To call them, to call them terrorist organization is part of the production of knowledge that is producing 
our NGOs as terrorists, producing our children as unchildren, producing our parents as un and unparenting them. And this is really what the settler colonial regime is doing because they're looking for all sorts of ways to penetrate, to infiltrate. But at the same time, you know, it's very well known. Every power has a counter power. So children are resisting and we are all resisting. Inside Palestine, of course, you know, people are, are uh, refusing such a definition and we really don't care for their definitions because after all, maybe we should all remember colonialism was done legally. And if it's a legal mode of calling and defining them with their emer emergency rules and security apparatus, we know that this is how they, they really steer their regime of control. And we see it in so many levels and on and exactly where we need to look. And maybe if I connect that to our topic on childhood, uh, Jacqueline, and on the issue of uh, ch children, you know, just the, the, the hearing um, uh, Shaina and Jumana, you can tell how arresting children from their bedrooms, from their homes, from their schools, on their way to school, and so on, detaining them, the carceral regime is, is really trying to dispossess, to unchild, to say these are not children. You know, in my research on child arrest in Jerusalem, uh, you know, we were in the Knesset to discuss child arrest because there was a high rate of arrest and the head of the committee on children's rights was there to discuss child arrest. The moment we said East Jerusalem, her reaction was, no, 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 no. These are not children. So the unchilding, is in so many places in the production of knowledge, whether in guns calling the sex organization, in, in, in the way they frame our kids, in the way they call the, what we call as killing boxes as watchtowers, because calling them watchtower is neutral, yeah? But Lama is telling us clearly, no, these are killing boxes. And these can be flying killing boxes in Gaza, and these are killing boxes here in Jerusalem. So what I want us always to remember when, when, when analyzing the way the settler colonial regime is, is functioning and the regime of control with all the technologies of surveillance, and yes, the necropolitical regime, because it is an economy of life and death. It is an economy of life and death that we need to remember how we are named, how they are naming us. We need to remember when analyzing childhood that we cannot medicalize or pathologize reactions to violence all the time. I'm not saying not to look at the effect, but I'm saying it's very, very crucial to politicize the analysis, to historicize the analysis, to contextualize it. And the context is that there is a criminal state and there is a settler colonial regime of control with a carceral regime against children in different places that is framing us in different modes, whether NGOs or whether individuals or whether families or whether our homes, because just look at Jerusalem. You know, Shaina was talking about schools and the schools that are awaiting demolitions. Over here, you know, they call it illegal building in Jerusalem. It's not illegal. It's illegal according to their law. It's unauthorized because they are not interested. Because if I take you back to what I said when I opened up, settler colonialism is a structure and it's about the eviction of the natives. So it's either evicting through ID system, evicting through not recognizing, evicting through not counting, evicting through unchilding. It's about the eviction and the indigenization of the settler. And here it's really crucial to look at, at what is going on in our country and to remember that children are resisting, are refusing, are, you know, we call it in Arabic, smooth steadfastness, because, and you hear it clearly in their voices. You know, I was, when I was studying the issue of uh, home arrest in Jerusalem, of course, as always, I always consult and engage with children. You know, what criminologists throughout years used to call home 
arrest as an alternative rehabilitative sentence, you know, home arrest for Palestinian children was about turning home into a prison and turning parents into prison guards, yeah? So the entire production of knowledge and the epistemic violence should stop. And if we are here speaking about children, we need to be careful in naming, in framing, and in contextualizing. Thank you so much. I think that notion of ep epistemic uh, violence um, and distortion is really critical and maybe answers actually a couple of our of our of the questions from our audience. Um, Shayna, I wondered if you could. Um, just, I mean, I'm going to particularize because one of the questions is um, the connection between the increasing uh, settler violence that you talked about and this latest kind of move to, you know, label you and other organizations as terrorists. Uh, how do you think this is actually going to affect your work? Um, is it going to make a substantial difference in practice or is it just yet another irritant like the many irritants that you deal with on a daily basis? Yeah, thanks, Jackie, for the question. Um, I mean, all of that, I'm, I'm going to be frank, last week, a lot of my effort and energy was spent working on our response to the, the designation, the terror designation. And so that's exactly the goal of this type of labeling is to prevent us from being able to, to do our work. Um, I think Despite that, people at DCIP are continuing to do our work. Our attorneys are still representing kids in the military courts, as crazy as that seems, working for a, a designated terrorist organization. Our documentation teams are still going out and documenting human rights abuses and violations. And, and mainly these, these labels are, are meant to be distractions, are meant to be things to criminalize us, to delegitimize us on the international um, stage, because we are going to the ICC, because we are engaging with UN bodies, um, and because we are seeing successes like we've seen here in the US with, with US Congress. Um, and so, yes, they are impacting our ability. Your success in a way. Exactly. I mean, that's why they're going after us, because we are being successful and we're going to continue to do the work that we're doing. We issued a statement last week. Our executive director said we are not going anywhere. So more power to you, Shana, and I think all of us here are so much behind uh, what, what you do and admire it and, and respect it so much. So we literally have one minute left. And Jumana, among the many good, excellent questions we've got, there's one uh, which asks about the risks for pregnant women and the impact on very young children of these circumstances that you talk about. To what extent do you think and do you see in your work at the Happy Child Center that, you know, there's even a kind of, you know, epigenetic transmission because young women with, you know, who are carrying babies are subject to this extraordinary degree of stress and fear. Um, is this something that you've thought about? Is this something that your patients have talked to you about? What, what can you tell us about that? Can't hear you. Uh, one, if one woman only gave birth on a checkpoint is enough uh, to show how brutal the life is and how hard and harsh and difficult for a Palestinian woman to have to give her birth at the checkpoint and not to be able to reach the hospital at, uh, at time. So uh, definitely our kids, our parents, our especially mothers, they, uh, I call them heroes because you know they do a lot, especially mothers of children with disabilities. Uh, the most vulnerable, the most un, uh, unserved population in the area. So. Uh, but as uh, my colleagues already mentioned, it is a resilient, resistant, and uh, uh, smooth. I mean, it's part of our life, but, and you know, uh, uh, on pregnant women in particular, it's uh, psychologically, of course, it affects uh, affect them. Uh, we don't have, unfortunately, enough researchers or studies uh, to show exactly what is the effect of. Previously, they were some uh, long ago, about 20, 25 years ago, during First Intifada, there were some studies on the tear gas and its effect on the pregnant woman. But nowadays, in Gaza also, there are some um, you know, anecdotal 
uh, stories, but uh, not proved yet. So we don't have scientific research on uh, this, the effect of occupational. But it is it, the whole the occupation. I I I lived half of my life or more under occupation. Uh, my kids lived all their lives. The, so Palestinian kids almost lived all their lives under military occupation. It's not normal. So we, they don't live under normal, uh, uh, I mean, situation. Yet, I say usually that 70 years of oppression, and we still live. I mean, uh, the occupation and the, uh, I mean, uh, uh, for so many years, the Palestinians have been uh, suffering under and living under military occupation, but we still live. We still celebrate our birthdays, the, our kids' birthdays. We still celebrate our weddings and graduations. And we, we are a nation that deserves to live. And our kids are showing the whole world that they deserve to live in dignity and in peace. And our peace and Israeli kids' peace is our freedom. When my child will, will uh, I mean, Palestinian children will get their freedom, the Israeli kids will get their peace. Mona, thank you again for that uplifting and encouraging um, comment. And thank you all. Unfortunately, this hour has just sped by. We've barely scratched the surface. So apologies to those of you who asked excellent questions, which we haven't got to. But I hope we will have future panels. So many, many thanks to our three really terrific panelists. Thank you to the organizers. Thanks, thanks to my, my colleagues at the FXB Center for making sure this all um, moves smoothly. And many thanks to our audience for, for, for listening and for sharing your comments. And we hope to see you again. Thank you. Goodbye.